Okay, class, as we left off talking about the classical age in India, we're going to continue here talking about how trade will spread Indian religion and culture. Uh, the 500 years between the Mauryan and Gupta empires was a time of upheaval. Invaders poured into India, bringing new ideas and customs. In response, Indians began to change their own culture. And two of those main changes, guys, is Buddhism and Hinduism. By 250 BC, Hinduism and Buddhism were India's two main faiths. Hinduism is a complex polytheistic religion that blended Aryan beliefs with the many gods and cults of the diverse peoples who preceded them. Buddhism teaches that desire causes suffering and that humans should overcome desire by following the Eightfold Path. Over the centuries, both religions had become increasingly removed from the people. Hinduism became dominated by priests, while the Buddhist ideal of self-denial proved difficult for many to follow. The Buddha had stressed that each person could reach a state of peace called nirvana. Nirvana was achieved by rejecting the sensory world and embracing spiritual discipline. After the Buddha died, his followers developed many different interpretations of his teachings. Although the Buddha had forbidden people to worship him, some began to teach that he was a god. Some Buddhists also began to believe that many people could become Buddhas. These potential Buddhas called Bud... Let's see... Bodhisattvas. <laughs> that one is tough, guys. Bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas. B O D H I S A T T V A S. I've read it several times, never been able to say it. Could choose to give up nirvana and work to save humanity through good works and self sacrifice. The new ideas changed Buddhism from a religion that emphasized individual discipline to a mass religion that offered salvation to all and allowed popular worship. By the first century AD, Buddhists had divided over the new doctrines. Those who accepted them belonged to Mahayana. Mahayana. Those who held the Buddha's stricter original teachings belonged to Theravada. This is also called the Hinayana, but Theravada is preferred. These new trends in Buddhism inspired Indian art. For example, artists carved huge statues of the Buddha for people to worship. Wealthy Buddhist merchants who were eager to do good deeds paid for the construction of stupas, which are mounded stone structures built over holy relics. Buddhists walked the path circling the stupas as a part of their meditation. Merchants also commissioned the carving of cave temples out of solid rock. Artists then adorned these temples with beautiful sculptures and paintings. Like Buddhism, Hinduism had become remote from the people. By the time of the Mauryan Empire, Hinduism had developed a complex set of sacrifices that could be performed only by the priest. People who weren't priests had less and less direction connecting with the religion. Gradually, through exposure to other cultures and in response to the popularity of Buddhism, Hinduism changed. Although the religion continued to embrace hundreds of gods, a trend toward monotheism was growing. Many people began to believe that there was only one divine force in the universe. The various gods represented parts of that force. The three most important Hindu gods were Brahma, creator of the world, Vishnu, preserver of the world, and Shiva, destroyer of the world. Of the three, Vishnu and Shiva were by far the favorites. Many Indians began to devote themselves to these two gods. As Hinduism evolved into a more personal religion, its popular appeal grew. Just as Hinduism and Buddhism underwent changes, so did Indian culture and learning. India entered a highly productive period in literature, art, science, and mathematics that continued until roughly AD 500. One of India's greatest writers, Kalidasa, he had been, uh, he may have been the court poet for Chandragupta II. Kalidasa's most famous play is the Shakuntala. It tells the story of a beautiful girl who falls in love with and marries a middle-aged king. 
After Shakuntala and her husband are separated, they suffer tragically because of a curse that prevents the king from recognizing his wife when they meet again. Generations of Indians have continued to admire Kalidasa's plays because they are skillfully written and emotionally stirring. In addition to literature, drama was very popular. In southern India, traveling troops of actors put on performances in cities across the region. Women, as well as men, took part in these shows, which combined drama and even dance. Many of the classical dance forms in India society today are based on techniques explained in a book written between the first century BC and the first century AD. The expansion of trade spurred the advance of science because sailors on trading ships used the stars to help them figure their position at sea, knowledge of astronomy increased. From Greek invaders, Indians adapted Western methods of keeping time. They began to use a calendar based on the cycles of the sun rather than the moon. They also adopted a seven day week and divided each day into hours. During the Gupta empire, knowledge of astronomy increased further. Almost 1000 years before Columbus, Indian astronomers proved that the earth was round by observing a lunar eclipse. During the eclipse, the earth's shadow fell across the face of the moon. The astronomers noted that the earth's shadow was curved, indicating that the earth itself was round. Indian mathematics was among the most advanced in the world. Modern numerals, the zero and the decimal system were invented in India. Around AD 500, an Indian named Ar Aribata calculated the value of pi to four decimal places. He also calculated the length of the solar year, 365.358.6805 <laughs> days. This is a very close to modern calculations made with the atomic clock. In medicine, two important medical guides were compiled. They described more than 1,000 diseases and more than 500 medical plants. Hindu physicians performed surgery, including plastic surgery and possibly even gave injections. In addition to knowledge, India has always been rich in precious resources. Spices, diamonds, sapphires, gold, pearls, beautiful woods, including ebony, teak, and fragrant sandalwood, have been valuable items of exchange. Trade between India and regions as distant as Africa and Sumeria began more than 4,000 years ago. Trade expanded even after the Mauryan Empire ended around 185 BC. Groups who invaded India after Mauryan rule helped to expand India's trade to new regions. For example, Central Asia nomads told Indians about a vast network of caravan routes known as Silk Roads. These routes were called the Silk Roads because traders used them to bring silk from China to Western Asia and then on to Rome. Once Indians learned of the Silk Roads, they realized they could make great profits by acting as middlemen. Middlemen are go-betweens in business transactions. For example, Indian traders would buy Chinese goods and sell them to traders traveling to Rome. To aid their role as middlemen, Indians built trading stations along the Silk Roads. They were located at oases, which are fertile spots in the desert areas. Sea trade also increased. Traders used coastal routes around the rim of the Arabian Sea and up the Persian Gulf to bring goods from India to Rome. In addition, Traders from southern India would sail to Southeast Asia to collect spices. They brought the spices back to India and sold them to merchants from Rome. Archaeologists have found hordes of Roman gold coins in southern, in southern India. Records show that some Romans were upset about the amount of gold their countrymen spent on Indian luxuries. They believed that to foster a healthy economy, a state must collect gold rather than spend it. Rome was not India's only sea trading partner. India imported African ivory and gold and exported cotton cloth, rice, and wheat went to Arabia in exchange for dates and horses. After trade with Rome declined around the 3rd century AD, India's sea trade with China 
and the islands of Southeast Asia increased. The Chinese, for example, imported Indian cotton cloth, monkeys, parrots, and elephants, and sent India silk. Increased trade led to the rise of banking in India. Commerce was quite profitable. Bankers were willing to lend money to merchants and charge them interest on the loans. Interest rates varied depending on how risky business was how risky business was. During Mauryan times, the annual interest rate on loans used for overseas trade had been 240%. During the Gupta Empire, bankers no longer considered sea trade so dangerous, so they charged only 15 to 20% interest a year. A number of Indian merchants went to live abroad and brought Indian culture with them. As a result, people throughout Asia picked up and adapted a variety of Indian traditions. For example, Indian culture affected styles in art, architecture, and dance throughout the South and Southeast Asia. Indian influence was especially strong in Thailand, Cambodia, and on the Indonesian island of Java. Traders also brought Indian religions to new re regions. Hinduism spread northeast to Nepal and southeast to Sri Lanka and Borneo. Buddhism spread because of traveling Buddhist merchants and monks. In time, Buddhism even will influence China, as we will see on our next slideshow presentation.